Good morning, church. I am thankful for your all's support as I traveled this last week. I got home late Friday and we ran the LGBTQ training yesterday. It was great to see some of you all there for that. And I am now feeling more and more settled back home as I'm gathered here with you. And I appreciate you all giving me some time away with family. Along the way, I have put together what I'd like to share with you all now as a potential movie script, a plot I've been devising, and I want to see what you all think about this. We begin with news coverage of a small town pastor who's been found beaten and left naked along the side of the road. Are you with me? Then they discover that he had actually been robbed at home, abducted, and dumped in this place to die. The news coverage continues with another breaking news as they discover that the music director of the same church had also been robbed in his home, abducted, and dumped along the same road, left to die. Can't you imagine? This sounds like Hollywood gold, doesn't it? Witnesses report seeing a similar person at both scenes as the drama builds. We start to get a sketch of the person. They start to dig into crime reports of things that had happened along that road, trying to figure out the connection and why we're there. Both of these men, it turns out, had traveled this road before. Both, in the past, had left an accident scene at that road without stopping. Both of them had been there years ago and left a man to die. The villain suddenly becomes an anti-hero. Social media surrounds this justice enforcer who's taken revenge on those who didn't take care of the community. He's standing up for himself and all those other victims that people walk right on by, punishing those who hurt them, taking care of those, punishing those who didn't fulfill their oath to care for others. Doesn't this sound like a great movie plot? I assume Liam Neeson plays the enforcer, right? <laughs> this sounds like a movie plot that would make a lot of money. It's a movie we would like, right? Maybe not us personally, but our society would love it. We love the revenge movie. We love the movie where blame leads us to action. Don't believe me? Here's a small list of movies with the same plot. Three Batmans, the whole Green Arrow TV show, Taken, Death Wish, Punisher, The Crow, Machete, Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, Girl with Everything Else, you can add it on, Payback, Unforgiven, Mad Max, Carrie, Kill Bill, One and Two, Man on Fire, Robocop, Commando, all of them, Rambo, all of them, Conan the Barbarian, and every movie Steven Seagal has ever appeared in. We like to spend money to see explosions and violence. But we need a reason, right? Like, we know it's bad. We know that killing's bad and murder's bad. We need a reason. Either it's got to be a really good war movie with a really clear villain and an exit strategy so that we don't debate the just war theory of it. Or it's got to be a really justified cause and someone blowing things up and killing people that we can get behind. Someone we can get behind. A good excuse to blow up things like cars, buildings, people. We have to tell the story. The story of someone wronged, someone abandoned by society, someone with nothing to lose. A story that justifies the slaughter. So back to our proposed movie plot. We have two victims that really deserve it. I mean, one's a minister. Come on, who cares, right? We can let them go. Two victims that said one thing and did another. Hypocrites. We all like judging the hypocrites, right? Not us, but those hypocrites. Two victims that will justify the action of our offender. But where does this attacker come from? Where have they been? What's their backstory? Well, it seems, as I kind of piece this story together, that there was a tragedy years ago. This stranger had been left by the side of the road. And after these folks passed by, someone else came and tended their wounds and did first aid at the scene. 
and then flagged down somebody to help them get them in their own car and took them to a local hotel. And they paid the hotel manager some extra money to bring a nurse in and help take care of them. And I think this sounds like a lot of great stories and could be a hit, except Jesus might want a little bit of mention in the credits. He might want some royalties. No, he wouldn't want royalties. He'd just want credit. And probably for me to have not ruined the story. What I've proposed sounds like most sequels. It's not nearly as good as the original story, and it may have missed the point. This could easily be a modern American perverted sequel to The Good Samaritan. I imagine Mel Gibson would want a part of the production on this. It's a little funny, kind of sad, but also it's a little true, doesn't it? We take a story about blame and fault, and instead of finding ourselves in it, try to justify anger or violence. We do it very easily in our world. Throughout Lent, we've been looking at issues of victim and survivorhood, what that means, how events lead us to see ourselves differently, physically, emotionally, how our world changes, how we realize things have been lost, and the fantasies of revenge that come out of that. We've been talking about being offenders and how an offender is usually a victim protecting themselves, justifying a behavior to protect themselves in the future, dehumanizing those who've hurt them until they can lash out. Today in our study after worship, we're going to look at breaking free from those cycles. And it all starts with blame. It all starts with blame. We're in a society that loves to blame, loves revenge, flaunts our faithfulness while glorifying and making excuses for the bad things we do in response. The original story we heard today that Aiden read was first released in about 34 AD, long before the Academy would ever make a movie and give awards for it. But it still captivates us. It still challenges us. Still today, the original story, the original Good Samaritan, also played on some of the same stereotypes we like to play on today. It played on assumptions that the listener, that the audience will make. Listeners to Jesus' story had assumptions about priests. They were religious leaders, ceremonial leaders of the faith community. They had assumptions about Levites. Some were religious leaders as musicians, others as property managers or security at the temple. They were the get it done people around the faith community. Each would have been expected, expected to be a good person, a good Jew, a good person of God. Yet each passed by on the other side. Each disappoints us as the listener. Wait, these are the ones we elevate as the good people. Let's see what they do. Oh, they didn't. So much so that we forget about the robbers in this story. How often when you read the Good Samaritan do you think about the robbers that started the whole darn thing? We get so wrapped up in the hypocrisy of the peers, the hypocrisy of the faith community. Sometimes we even forget the Samaritan. We forget that he was a foreigner, an outsider. Someone that the audience would have assumed was not neighbor. Thus Jesus flipping it on its head. We forget about the innkeeper who agreed to take on extra responsibility. Clearly he was not in Southern California and scared of a lawsuit, right? We forget the robbers, though. Those who actually attacked. We get so caught up in anger, frustration, and our own expectations, we forget the original offender. We misplace our fantasy of revenge on the hypocrites often instead of the robbers reminds us that blame blame is a dangerous thing blame is a dangerous thing blame answers a question but not always with facts or truth blame answers a question but it's not always the right question blame is a dangerous thing Blame shapes our story. It explains an event for us. Blame shapes our response. It shapes our response to an event. Blame is a dangerous thing. Blame allows us to dismiss the humanity of others. Blame moves us from being hurt to hurting others. Blame is a dangerous thing. Blame asks why 
Why were we hurt and who should we punish? Why was I hurt and who do I punish for it? That's where blame leads us. Blame asks why we were hurt, but we usually don't dig deep enough. We usually don't dig deep enough or take the answers seriously. We don't dig deep enough and we take half-truths and bias with a full scoop of our own assumptions. Blame is powerful. It's a drug. It's a monster. Blame is powerful. It transforms us from victims into offenders. What, what if we stopped? What if we stopped blame and instead started seeking understanding? What if we could stop blaming and trying to seek understanding? Why did the priest look the other way? Instead of, you darn priest, why did you look the other way? Priest, why? Why did you look the other way? I want to know. Was you, were you worried about ritual cleanliness? Were you worried about being attacked personally? Were you on your way to a crisis somewhere? Priest, why? I don't understand. Why did the Levite pass by and understand? Not church leader, why did you let me down? Darn you. Instead, did you feel unsafe? What happened to you? Were you worried that you wouldn't know what to do? Were you scared of feeling helpless? Church leader, mentor of mine, why did you walk on by? I don't understand. Bully, why did you hit me? Why did you hurt me? What did I do wrong? Did I say something that I didn't realize? Do I scare you? Do I make you jealous? Did someone hurt you? Did someone else scare you? Do you understand how much you scared me? I don't understand why you would treat me this way. Beloved partner, what did I ever do to you? Did I hurt you? Did someone else hurt you? Do you not feel worthy of the love I gave? Did someone else leave you and you feel so fragile you had to leave me? Did you not feel ready for more responsibility? Did you not believe how much I loved you? Partner of mine, why did you leave? I don't understand. Why did my community ignore me? Did they not notice my pain? Did they not hear my cries? Did they not know how broken I was? Did others need more attention than I? Did someone else get abandoned too? Did my expectations set me up for disappointment? Community of mine, why did you turn your eye from me? The power of a parable lies in its layers. We can see ourselves in it in lots of different ways. This time, in this listening to the Good Samaritan, we can see ourselves in lots of different places, but I invite you to find yourself in the blame we hold for the passerby. In the blame we hold for the passersby. I invite you to find our society in the lack of accountability we look for in the robbers, instead fixating on the blame for the passerby. I invite you to reflect on our society's lack of questioning about the hurt of the robbers and our obsession with hypocrisy and blaming of those around us. Or maybe we even ask the questions, why were these people robbing in the first place? This time, in this listening, I invite you to reflect on the way blame can control us, on the way blame can contort us, can twist us and corrupt us. I invite you to reflect on the way blame has continued to hurt us, the way blame gives us permission to hurt others. May we find the courage to seek truth, to seek facts, to offer grace, to seek healing, for our hurts, 
The journey from victim to offender is short. The victim to offender journey is short. And sadly, it is often.